This year is the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ulysses, a masterpiece of English literature. It is also the volume most likely to be unopened on your bookshelf. <laughs> Why is that? Why is it considered difficult? Joyce said, if you don't understand something I wrote, read it aloud. If that doesn't work, change your drink. <laughs> so we're going to read some of it out loud. And we're going to present episodes from the book that we like with pictures and songs. We're here to celebrate a small part of the joys of Joyce. The rest of the treasure trove is for you to dig up. Ulysses is the record of a single day in the lives of its three main characters in Dublin on Thursday, June the 16th, 1904. It was published on February the 2nd, 1922, Joyce's 40th birthday. Now, who are these three? The statue on the left, who looks like he's scratching a pimple, is Telemachus, the son of Odysseus, who is represented in our book, the one we're talking about, by Steve, uh, Stephen Dedalus, who is James Joyce. This is Penelope, who is famous for her personality and her fidelity for 10 years, waiting for Ulysses to come home. This is Molly Bloom, Penelope in Ulysses. She is renowned for her personality. <laughs> and here's Ulysses himself, only his name is Leopold Bloom, a modern, apparently unheroic man. And here's the central character of the book, Molly's husband. And there is a fourth protagonist, Dublin City, O'Connell Street. Twelve years after Bloomsday, the GPO next to, next to this Nelson Pillar, was the focal point of the Irish rebellion that led to Irish independence. In 1966, Nelson Pillar was blown up. And I was interested to read in the paper today that the man who did it has just died, age 103. He had no remorse. <laughs> Ulysses is written in 18 episodes. The first three concern Stephen. It's a continuation of the portrait of the artist. Stephen is 22. He has no doubts about his genius. Well, we were all a little bit like that once. Thing is, Joyce then went on to write Ulysses. But not yet he hasn't. As Ulysses begins, he is in turmoil. His mother has just died and he is racked with guilt. His father is a spendthrift, often inebriated. Piston broke, as we say in Shoreham. <laughs> Stephen is the oldest of 10 siblings. He has no money. He lives in a Martello Tower in Sandy Cove on the south end of Dublin Bay with Buck Mulligan, a medical student, and Haynes the Englishman. Stately plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and razor lay crossed. He held the bone aloft and intoned Introibo ad altare dei. Come up, Kinch. Come up, you fearful Jesuit. The mockery of it, your absurd name, an ancient Greek. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the aunt to fork out 20 quid? Will he come, the jejune Jesuit? Will he come? Ah, look at the sea now. Isn't it what Algy called it? A great sweet mother, the snot green sea, the scrotum tightening sea, epioinopa ponton, the latter, the latter. The aunt thinks you killed your mother. You could have knelt down, damn it. Kinch, when your dying mother asked you, I'm as hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused. There's something sinister in you. 
Suddenly, in a dream, she had come to him after her death, her wasted body within her loose brown grave clothes, giving off an odour of wax and rosewood. Her breath that had been bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odour of wetted ashes. But a lovely mummer, Kinch, the loveliest mummer of them all. Ah, poor dog's body. I must give you a shirt and a few nose rags. How are the second-hand bricks? Ah, they fit well enough. Second leg, they should be called. God knows what poxy bells he left him off. Look at yourself, you dreadful bard. Here, look at yourself. <laughs> the symbol of Irish art. The cracked looking glass of a servant. Cracked looking glass of a servant. Tell that to the oxy chap downstairs and touch him for a guinea. What is it? Cough it up. What have you got against me now? Do you remember? The first day I went to your house after my mother's death. What? Where? I, I, I don't remember anything. I remember only ideas and separation. Why, what happened in the name of God? You were making tea. You said to your mother, it's only Daedalus whose mother is beastly dead. Did I say that? Well, what harm is in it? And what is death? Your mother's or yours or my own? You saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the martyr and the richman and cut into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. You wouldn't kneel to pray. You have the cursed Jesuit strain in you, only it's injected the wrong way. Although I suppose I did say it. I, I didn't mean any harm to your mother. I'm not thinking of the offence to my mother. Of what then? Of the offence to me. Oh, impossible person. I'm not sleep here tonight. Home also I cannot go. A voice, sweet-toned and sustained, called to him from the sea. Turning the curve, he waved his hand, he called again. A sleek brown head, seals far out on the water, round usurper. <laughs> In the second episode of Ulysses, Stephen goes to his part-time teaching job and is paid. As the headmaster, Mr. Deasy, gives him his wages, a conversation arises. They sinned against the light, and that is why they are wanderers on the earth to this day. Who has not? What do you mean? He came forward a pace and stood by the table. His under jaw fell sideways, open uncertainly. He waits to hear from me. History is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. From the playfield, the boys raised a shout, a whirring whistle, go! What if the nightmare gave you a back kick? The ways of the creator are not our ways. All human history moves towards the manifestation of God. Stephen jerked his thumb towards the window, saying, That is God. Hooray! What? A shout in the street. Stephen answered, shrugging his shoulders. I will fight for the right till the end. For Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right. Well, sir, I foresee that you will not remain here very long at this work. You were not born to be a teacher, I think. Well, perhaps I'm wrong. A learner, perhaps? And here, what will you learn more? To learn, one must be humble. 
Oh, but life is a great teacher. Stephen rustled the sheets again. As regards to these. <laughs> ah, you have two copies there concerning the foot and mouth. If you can have them both published at once. Uh, I will try, as Stephen said, and let you know tomorrow. I know two editors slightly. Well, that will do. I wrote last night to Mr. Field, MP. I asked him to lay my letter before the meeting. So you see if you can get it into your two papers. There's no time to lose. Now, I have to answer that letter from my cousin. Uh, good morning, sir. Oh, not at all. I like to break a lance with you, old as I am. <laughs> good morning, sir. Stephen said again, bowing to his bent back. He went out by the open porch and down the gravel path under the trees, hearing the cries of voices and crack of sticks. From the play field, the lions cushion on the pillars as he passed out through the gate. Toothless terrors. Still, I will help him in his fight. Mulligan will dub me a new name. The Bullock Befriending Bar. Mr. Dedalus! Oh, uh, he comes again. Oh, no more letters, I hope. Just one moment. Uh, yes, sir, Stephen said, turning back at the gate. I just wanted to say, Ireland, they say, has the honour of being the only country which never persecuted the Jews. You know that? No? And do you know why? Uh, why, sir? Because she never let them in. <laughs> uh, uh, a cough ball of laughter leapt from his throat, dragging after it a rattling chain of flesh. <coughs> he turned back quickly, coughing, laughing, his lifted arm waving to the air. She'd never let them in, that's why. On his wise shoulders, through the checkerwork of leaves, the sun flung spangles, dancing coins. Stephen catches a train towards the city centre, alighting at Sandy Mount, still two miles away from the centre of Dublin. The third episode represents his thoughts. Now this is the first difficult chapter. The lad can let fly his erudition, for he's only talking to himself, or interior monologue as it's properly called. Here's a taste. Ineluctable modality of the visible, at least that. Thought through my eyes, signatures of all things I am here to read. Il maestro de color Cassano, limit of the diaphany in. Why in? Diaphany, a diaphany. If you can put your five fingers through it, it is a gate. If not, a door. Shut your eyes and see. One of the sisterhood loved me, squealing into life. The cords of all link back. Strand and twining cable of all flesh. You see what I mean? Yet this chapter is amongst my favorites. For one thing, it improves your vocabulary. <laughs> for another... Books, you are going to write with letters for titles. Have you read his F? Oh, yes, but I prefer you. Yes, but W is wonderful. Ah, oh, yes, W. When one reads these strange pages of one long gone, one feels that one is at one with one. Ah, one. but we're brought back to the present. You are who going to do wonders. What? Pretending to speak broken English as you dragged your valise, porter threepence across the slimy here at New Haven. Come on. A blue French telegram. Mother dying. Come home. Father. He turned his face over his shoulder, moving through the air, high spars of a three-master. Her sails brailed up in the cross trees homing upstream, silently moving, a silent ship.
Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. Oh, I'm going around the corner. I'll uh, be back in a minute. Uh, you don't want anything for breakfast? Mm. On the doorstep, he felt in his hip pocket for the latch key. Not there. In the trousers I left off. Creaky wardrobe. No use disturbing him. She turned over sleepily that time. Oh, good day, Mr. O'Rourke. Good day to you. Lovely weather, sir. Tis all that. He halted before Blue Gatch's window, staring at the banks of sausages. Polonies, black and white. The slinky links packed with force meat fed his gaze and he breathed in tranquilly the lukewarm breath of cooked, spicy pig's blood. <laughs> he thought of his daughter, Millie. Quick, warm sunlight came, running from Barclay Road, swiftly in slim sandals along the brightening footpath, runs. She runs to meet me. A girl with gold hair on the wind. He returns home. Number seven, Eccles Street. Oh, two letters and a card lay on the hall floor. He stopped and gathered them. Mrs. Marion Bloom. His quickened heart slowed at once. Bold hand. Mrs. Marion. Baldy. Entering the bedroom with half-closed eyes and walked through the warm yellow twilight towards her tousled head. Who are the letters for? Oh, a letter to me from Millie and a card to you and uh, a letter to you. Do you want the blind up? Letting the blind up by gentle tugs halfway. With uh, his backward eye, he saw her glance at the letter and took it under her pillow. Uh, that do. She got the thing, she said. Oh, hurry up with the tea. I'm parched. I'm baldy. What? Scald the teapot. <laughs> the plume of steam from the spout. Cats won't eat pork, they say. <laughs> They're kosher. <laughs> he dropped the kidney amid the sizzling butter sauce. Pepper. He sprinkled it through his fingers ringwise from the chipped egg cup. Who was the letter from? Oh, Boylan. He's bringing the program. Mm, what are you singing? Lachi de Rem with J.C. Doyle and Love's Old Sweet Song. What time's the funeral? Oh, uh, 11, I think. I, I haven't seen the paper. There's a word in this book. I wanted to ask you, here, what does that mean? Oh, metempsychosis. Yes, who's he when he's at home? Well, metempsychosis, uh, it's Greek, but from the Greek. That means the, um, the transmigration of souls. Oh, rocks, tell us in plain words. <laughs> Did you finish it? The uh, ruby, the pride of the ring? Yes, there's nothing <coughs> smutty in it. Is she a group of the first fellow the whole time? Well, I've never read it. Do you want another? Yes, get one of that Paul de Cox. Nice name he has. <laughs> uh, metempsychosis is what the ancient Greeks called it. We uh, go on living in another body after death. Reincarnation. You could be changed into uh, an animal or a tree, for instance. Or a nymph. There's a smell of burr. Did you leave something on the fire? The kidney!
begins his odyssey through Dublin. By lorries, along Sir John Rogerson's key, Mr. Bloom walked soberly past Windmill Lane, Leeks, the Linseed Crusher, the postal telegraph office, past the sailors' home. He turned from the morning noises at the quayside and walked through Lime Street. By Brady's cottages, a boy for the skins love. His bucket of awful linked, smoking a chewed fag book. A smaller girl with scars of eczema on her forehead, eyed him blisslessly holding her battered cask hoop. Tell him, if he smokes, he won't grow. Uh, let him. His life isn't such a bed of roses. Waiting outside pubs to bring Da home. Oh, come home to my Da. Met her once in the park. In the dark. What a lark. At least typed me. Her name and address she then told with my two rilling, two rilling pay. Surely he bagged it. Very cheap and a watch him a call. With my two rilling, two rilling. He took the Freeman from his side pocket, tapped it at each sauntering step against his trouser leg. He darted a quick look through the door of the post office. No one in. Um, are there any letters for me? He asked. The postmistress handed him back through the grill his card with a letter. He thanked her and glanced rapidly at the typed envelope. Henry Flower Esquire, care of Post Office Westland Road, City. He slipped it quickly into his side pocket. He passed the cabman's shelter. <laughs> Curious, the life of drifting cabbies. All weathers, all places, time was set down. No will of their own. Volio et non. I'd like to give him the odd cigarette. Sociable. Shout a few flying syllables as they passed. He hummed. La citarem la mano la 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 la. <coughs> he turned into Cumberland Street. Piled bulks. Ruins and tenements. With 
careful tread, he picked over a hopscotch caught with its forgotten picket stone. Near the timber yard, a squatted child at marbles alone, shooting the tall with a cunny thumb. He opened the letter within the newspaper. A flower. Oh, I think it's a. What does she say? Dear Henry, I got your last letter and I thank you very much for it. I'm awfully angry with you. I do wish I could punish you for that. I called you naughty boy because I do not like that other word. Please tell me, what is the meaning of that word? Oh dear Henry, when will we meet? I've never felt myself so much drawn to a man as to you. Please write me a long letter. If you do not, I will punish you. So, now you know what I will do to you, you naughty boy, if you do not wrote. I have such a bad headache today. And write by return to your longing, Martha. P.S. Do tell me what kind of perfume does your wife use? I want to know. <laughs> he tore the flower gravely from its pinhole. Smelt, it's almost no smell. And placed it in his heart pocket. <laughs> On June the 16th, 1904, James Joyce went out on his first date with Nora Barnacle. An erotic and passionate act occurred <laughs> towards the end of the evening. It was a hand job. <laughs> but a very romantic one. They spent the rest of their lives together eventually marrying in 1931. 37 years after that first walking out, Joyce died in Zurich, having fled the Nazi invasion of Paris. The year was 1941, and the cause of death was gastrointestinal hemorrhage caused by a dude in Lalta. He was 58. Nora outlived him by 10 years and would not let the Roman Catholic Church near him. She wanted his remains to be reinterred in Ireland, but the Archbishop McQuaid refused on catechistic grounds. Leopold Bloom is a human being. He belches, he farts, he defecates, he urinates, and he masturbates, all in plain view of the reader. He may be the first character to do so in English literature. You wouldn't say it in Jane Austen. <laughs> Others perform sexual intercourse. Such perverted and unthinkable descriptions of human behavior are unacceptable. So the book was banned in many countries, not France, <laughs> but including the UK and the USA. This unintended marketing masterstroke <laughs> catapulted him to fame and wealth. Everybody was looking to buy the dirty book. A notable trial in America ultimately concluded that this was not legally obscene. Here's a picture of Joyce's tomb in Zurich. Here he is. How much do curators make each one in person? Let me that much. Reading from Finnegan's Wake. Out of your Sanskrit into our Aryan. Hircus Chivis Eblanensis. He had buckcoat paps on him, soft ones, for orphans. Oh, no, twins of his bosom, no, it saves. And ho, hey, for all men, ha, huh? his tittering daughter, thou, walk, and kill with the water, thou, the chittering water, thou, flittering bats, field mice, bark, talk, ho, oh, are you not? On a home. What Tom Malone can't hear the bark of bats, 
all the lithium waters out. All talk sailors. My boots won't move. I feel as old as yonder alum. A tale told of Sean of Shem, all Libya's daughter sons. Dark hawks hear us. My whole head falls. I feel as heavy as yonder stone. Tell me of Sean of Shem. Who well shall be shown the living sons and daughters of? Night now, tell me, tell me, tell me, Elm. Night, night, tell me tale of stem of stone beside the rivering waters of, hither and tithering waters of, my... Gobbling a brand new pair of rogues, rattling all the dogs, frightened all the dogs on the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five, hunt the hair and turn them down the rocky road, and all the ways to Dublin, what for lally da? In all in gar that night, they sat and been so weary, solid by daylight, they stole in right and early. I took a drop of the pure to hit my heart from sinking. That's a paddy's cure when he's born for drinking to see the lasses smile, laughing all the while at the curious sight. to sit your heart to bubbling, tax me was I hired, wages I required, till I was almost tired of the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five. Hunt the hair and turn them down the rocky road and all the way to Dublin, what for lally da? In Dublin next to Royal, I thought it's such a pity to be so soon deprived of you of better city. So I took a stroll, house among the quality we bundle in the store. In the peak locality, something crossed me mind. When I looked behind, the bundle could I find? On the stick, a wobbling inquiring for the road. They said me come off road, wasn't much in vogue. For the rocky road to Dublin, one, two, three, four, five. Hunt the hair and turn them down the rocky road. And all the ways to Dublin, what for lally From there I got away, my spirits never faded, landed on the gate, just as the boat was sailing. Captain at me, raw, said the fool, and he, when I got aboard, a cabin crammed for paddy, down among the peaks, gates and weary rigs, dance and weary jigs, the water round me, bobbling, till a paddy head, I wish me sent was dead, there's a fire instead, on the rocky road to Dublin, once, once a three for five, hop the hair and turn me down the rocky road, and all the ways to Dublin, what for lally now? The boys of Liverpool, when I safely landed, it called me self a fool. I could no longer stand it, blood began to boil. Temper I was losing, poor old Erin's eye. They began to give in her arm as false as I, Shillelagh, I looked fly. Galway boys were by this saw I was a hobbling with a loud hooray. They joined in the affray, quickly cleared the way for the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five, hump the head and turn them down the rocky road. And all the doors to Dublin, my fellow, and he died. When times are hard and will not go right, though you do the best you can, and the body life is black as the hours of night, a point of plane is your only man. When money is scarce and hard to get, and your horse is an also ram, and all you got is a pile of debt. A point of plane is your only man. When money is, when food is scarce and your pantry is bare, and there's no rashers in your pan, and hunger comes but there's nothing there, a point of plane is your only man. In times of trouble and lousy strife, 
and no rashes suit your pan. Your world opens up to a brighter life. A point of plain is your only man. Oh. <laughs> Poor old Dicey Riley, she has taken to the sop. Poor old Dicey Riley, she will never give it up. It's for she goes into the pop and then it's up for another little sop. On the heart of the road is Dicey Riley. She walks along Fitzgibbon Street with an independent air. And then it's on to Summer Hill and as the people stare, one woman puts them all to shame. Just one was worthy of the name and the name of the dame is Dicey Riley. I have strict TT, says Joe. Not taking anything between drinks, says I. <laughs> Come round to Barney Kiernan, says Joe. I want to see the citizen. Barney Mavornan's be it, says I. Anything strange or wonderful, Joe? Not a word, says Joe. So we turned into Barney Kiernan's, and there, sure enough, was the citizen with that bloody mangy mongrel, Gary Owen, and he waiting for what the sky would bring in the way of a drink. Give it a name, citizen, says Joe. Wine of the country. What's yours, says Joe? Ditto Mac and Espy, says I. Three points, Terry, says Joe. And how's the old heart, citizen? Never better, Akira. What, Gary, we're going to win? Bloom enters the pub. And be gab, he's letting on to be awfully deeply interested in nothing. And the citizen scowling after him and the old dog at his feet looking up to know who to bite and when. The strangers, our own fault. We let the Saxon robbers come in. Now, Bloom tries to back him up with moderation and botheration and their colonies and their civilization. Their civilization, you mean? <laughs> Any civilization? They stole from us. Tone-tied sons of bastards ghosts. I was in Europe. You wouldn't see a trace of them or their language anywhere in Europe. Conspirales anglais, perfide albion, l'andere The great empire that they boast about of drudges and slaves on which the sun never rises. And the tragedy of it is that the unfortunate yahoos believe it. They believe in the rod, the scourge of the almighty. Isn't discipline the same everywhere? Didn't I tell you, as true as I'm drinking this porter, if he was at his last gasp, he'd be trying to down faces saying that living was dying. We'll put force against force. And when they come again, there will be no cravens amongst us. The sons of Grona Whale, the champions of Kathleen Nahulahan. Well, perfectly true, but my point was... Uh, will you try another, citizen, says Joe. Yes, sir, I will. Says he you, says Joe. Beholden to you, Joe, says I. May your shadow never grow less. Repeat that dose, says Joe to the barman. Bloom was talking excitedly with that dundockety mud coloured mug on him and his old plum eyes rolling about. Do you know what a nation means? Yes. What is it? Well, a nation is the same people living in the same place. <laughs> if that's so, I'm a nation. As I've been living in the same place for years. <laughs> what is your nation, may I ask? Ireland. I was born here, Ireland. The citizen says nothing, only clears the spit out of his gullet, and Gabby spat a red bank <coughs> oyster out of him right into the corner. And I belong to a race, <laughs> too, says Bloom, that is hated and persecuted. This very moment, robbed, plundered, insulted, persecuted, sold by auction in Morocco like slaves or cattle. Are you talking about the new Jerusalem? I'm talking about injustice. Then stand up to it then, like a man! Oh, but it's no use. Force, hatred, history, all that. 
That's not life for men and women. Insult and hatred. And everybody knows that's the very opposite of real life. Real life? Love, says Bloom. And you apostle to the Gentiles. Do you call that a man? Men, well, there were two children born anyhow. And who does he suspect? Bloom's out the door and getting into a jaunting car. The bloody dog wakes up and gives out a growl. And the gob! I was just lowering the heel of a point when I saw the citizen getting up to waddle to the door, puffing and blowing with his dropsy, and cursing the curse of Cromwell on him, bell, book, and candle, in Irish, spitting and a spatting. Three cheers for Israel! Hey, mister, your fly is all gone! Hey, Mendelssohn was a Jew. Karl Marx and Mercadante and Spinoza, and the saviour was a Jew, and his father was a Jew, your God. Who's God? Your God was a Jew. Christ was a Jew, like me. I pray the bloody Jew man for using the holy name. By Jesus, I crucify him, I will. Give us that biscuit box here. Stop, stop, says Joe. Where is he till I murder him? Begabi drew his hand and made a swipe out and let fly. Mercy of God, the sun was in his eyes, or he'd have left him for dead. He near sent it into the county Longford, with the populace laughing and shouting, and the old tin box clattering along the street. After him, Gary! After him, boy! And the last we saw was the bloody car round in the corner. When lo! There came about them all a great brightness, and they beheld the chariot wherein he stood ascend to heaven. And there came a voice out of he heaven calling, Elijah, Elijah. He answered, Addis Abonai. And they beheld Ben Bloom, Elijah, amid clouds of angels, ascend to the glory at an angle of about 45 degrees <laughs> over that old John Hughes, a little green street, like a shot off a shovel. <laughs> the world in its mysterious embrace. Far away in the west the sun was setting and the last glow of all too fleeting day lingered lovingly on sea and strand on the proud promontory of dear old Hoth, guarding as ever the waters on the bay. Sissy came along the strand with the two twins and their ball and her hat anyhow, and a bit of a petticoat hanging out like a caricature. Gertie just took off her hat for a moment to settle her hair, and a prettier, a daintier head of nut-brown tresses was never seen on a girl's shoulders. A radiant little vision. He was eyeing her as a snake <laughs> eyes its prey. <laughs> A woman's instinct told her that he had raised the devil in him, and at the thought a burning scarlet swept from throat to brow till the lovely colour of her face became a glorious rose. Oh, I said, quick as lightning, 
laughing. I can throw my cap at who I like because it's leap year. Oh, look, Sissy. Was it sheet lightning over the trees beside the church, blue and then green and purple? It's fireworks, Sissy Caffey said. The eyes that were fastened on her set her pulses tingling. She looked at him a moment, meeting his glance, and a light broke in upon her. White hot passion was in that face. She leaned far back to look up where the fireworks were and caught her knee in her hand so as not to fall back looking up. And there was no one to see, only him and her, when she revealed all her graceful, beautifully shaped legs like that. And she saw a long Roman candle going up over the trees, up, up, up. And she had to lean back more, and he could see her other things too. Nance of knickers. She was trembling in every limb from being bent so far back, and she wasn't ashamed. And he kept on looking and looking, and she held out her snowy, slender arms for him to come, to feel his lips laid on her white brow, the cry of a young girl's love, the cry that had rung through the ages. And then a rocket sprang, <laughs> and bang shot blind <coughs> blank, and oh! Then the Roman candle burst, and it was like a sigh of oh. And everyone cried, oh, oh, in raptures. And it gushed out of it, a stream of rain, gold hair, threads, and they shed, and oh. They were all greeny, dewy stars falling with golden, oh, so lovely, oh, soft, sweet, soft. She glanced at him as she bent forward quickly. Leopold Bloom, for it is he, <laughs> stands silent with bowed head before those young guileless eyes. What a brute he had been. <laughs> that was their secret, only theirs, and there was none to know or tell save the little bat that flew so softly through the evening to and fro. A little bats don't tell. <laughs> Slowly, she went down the uneven strand to Sissy, Edie and Jackie. It was dark now, and there were stones and bits of wood on the strand and slippy seaweed. She walked with a certain quiet dignity characteristic of her, but with care and very slowly because Gertie McDowell was tight boots. No, she's lame. Oh. Come out of that, you poxy bowsy. 
Jesus wept and no wandered by Christ. Anyhow, well, anyhow, Bloom and Stephen thread their differing ways through the thoroughfares, lanes, and eight further episodes of A Day in the Life of Dublin. They walk past each other on two occasions, but it's, it is only a sudden thunderstorm makes Bloom seek refuge in the entrance of the Hollis Street lying in hospital that the two meet. Bloom sees an old friend of his, Dr. Dixon, who invites him in for a drink in the hospital. In the room at the back, the medical students are knocking back a few. Buck Mulligan is there, as is Stephen Dedalus. They are all worse for the wear. Later that night, Stephen and some of his acquaintances stumble off towards Night Town, the red light district. Bloom follows for two reasons. The first is his ordinary human concern for a drunken Stephen. He wants to keep an eye on him. The second is that he is afraid to go home. He is in dread of intercepting Blazes Boylan with his wife Molly. In the night town episode, there is a hallucinatory explosion of lewdness, perversion, paranoia, and if you don't mind me saying so, Grand Guignol. Since we have enough of that in our everyday lives, right here in Shoreham, we shall pass that episode by. At one o'clock in the morning, Stephen collapses on the pavement. Leopold hastens to his aid. Preparatory to anything else, Mr. Broom blushed off the greater bulk of the shavings and handed Stephen the hat and ash plant and booked him up generally in orthodox Samaritan fashion which, um, which he very much needed. He, um, he commented adversely on the desertion of Stephen by all his pop-hunting confreres but one, a most glaring piece of ratting on the part of his brother Medicos under all the circs. Yeah. Where, he added with a smile, uh, will you sleep tonight? Well, walking to Sandy Cove was out of the question, and, and supposing you did, well, you, you mightn't get in, simply fag out there for nothing. Why did you leave your father's house? <clears throat> to seek misfortune. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bloom and Stephen entered the cabman's shelter. Now, touching a cup of coffee, Mr. Bloom ventured to plausibly suggest that perhaps a roll of some description? Stephen, uh, who was trying his dead best to yawn if he could, suffering from lassitude generally, for which reason Bloom did the honours of uh, pushing the cup of what was temporarily supposed to be called coffee gradually nearer him with a, a rather antediluvian specimen of a bomb. Sounds are impostures, like names. Cicero, Podmore, Mr. Goodbody, Jesus, Mr. Doyle. Shakespeare's were as common as Murphy's. What's in a name? Oh, <laughs> yes, to be sure, Mr. Bloom unaffectedly concurred. <laughs> no, of course, yeah. but our name was changed too, uh, from Virage. A red bearded sailor boarded Stephen. And what might your name be? Dedalus. You know Simon Dedalus? Oh, I've heard of him. He's Irish. How too Irish. <laughs> you suspect, he said, with a half laugh, <laughs> that I may be important because I belong to the Faubourg St. Patrice, called Ireland for short. Well, I would go a step further, Mr. Bloom insinuated. But I suspect, Stephen interrupted, that Ireland may be important because it belongs to me. Well, what belongs, fancying he was perhaps under some misapprehension. Uh, excuse me, I didn't catch- Stephen, patently cross-tempered, repeated, and shoved aside his mug of coffee, or whatever you like to call it, adding, we can't change the country. Let's change the subject. Hmm? Do you consider, by the by, he said, 
thoughtfully, selecting a faded photo which he laid on the table. That, a Spanish type? Stephen obviously addressed, looked down on the photo showing a large sized lady with her fleshy charms on evidence in an open fashion as she was in the full bloom of womanhood. In evening dress cut ostentatiously low for the occasion to give a liberal display of bosom with more than vision of breasts. Her full lips parted in some perfect teeth. Standing near ostensibly with gravity, a piano on the rest of which was in old Madrid a ballad Pretty in its way, which was then all the vogue. Mrs. Bloom, my wife. Oh. The prima donna, Madame Marion Tweedy. Well, it's taken a few years since, mm. in or about 96. Very like her then. At what time did you dine? <laughs> Sometime yesterday. Yesterday. The day before yesterday. He prudently pocketed the photo. As it's rather stuffy here, you just come home with me and talk things over. But my, my diggings are quite close in the vicinity. You can't drink that stuff. Do you like coffee? Wait, I'll just pay this lot. <laughs> And so, united finally, the father who is seeking his son and the son who is seeking his father make their way through the side streets of Dublin to number seven, Echo Street. And what did the Dianverit deliberate during their itinerary? Ah, music, literature, Ireland, Dublin, Paris, friendship, woman, prostitution, diet, the influence of gaslight or the light of the arc and glow lamps on the growth of adjoining paraheliotropic trees, exposed Corporation emergency dust buckets, the Roman Catholic Church, ecclesiastical celibacy, the Irish nation, Jesuit education, careers, the study of medicine, the past day, the maleficent influence of the pre Sabbath, Stephen's collapse. What did they both observe? The heaven tree of earth hung with humid night blue fruit. What act did Bloom make on their arrival at their destination? At the house steps of the fourth of the equidistant uneven numbers, seven, Eccles Street, he inserted his hand mechanically into the back pocket of his trousers to obtain his latch key. Was it there? It was in the corresponding pocket of the trousers which he had worn on the day but one preceding. Why was he doubly irritated? Because he had forgotten and because he remembered that he had reminded himself twice not to forget. <laughs> uh, Bloom's decision? A strategy. He climbed over the area railings compressed his hat upon his head and lowered his body by its length of five feet nine inches and a half to within two feet ten inches of the area pavement and allowed his body to move freely in space by separating himself from the railings. <laughs> ah. Minutes later, he quietly opens the front door and signals to Stephen. Did Stephen obey his sign? Yes. Entering softly, he helped to close and chain the door followed softly along the hallway the man's back and listed feet lighted candle passed a lighted crevice of doorway on the left carefully down a turning staircase of more than five steps into the kitchen of bloom's house what is a home without plum trees potted meat 
Incomplete. <laughs> Does Bloom invite Stephen to stay? Yes. What is his response? Stephen thanks him and declines. What follows? They part. What is Bloom's next step? He deposited some articles of clothing on a chair, uh, removed his remaining articles of clothing, took uh, from beneath the bolster at the head of the bed a folded long white nightshirt, inserted his head and arms into the proper apertures of the nightshirt, <laughs> removed a pillow from the head to the foot of the bed, prepared the bed linen accordingly, and entered the bed. How? With circumspection. <laughs> Lightly, the less to disturb. Reverently, from the bed of conception and of birth, of consummation of marriage and of breach of marriage, of sleep and of death, what did his limbs, when gradually extended, encounter? New, clean bed linen, additional odors, or the presence of a human form, female, hers, the imprint of a human form, male, not his. Mm. Some crumbs, some flecks of potted meat, <laughs> Re which he removed. Then he kissed the plump, mellow, yellow, smellow melons of her rump <laughs> on each plump, melonous hemisphere. A mellow, yellow furrow with obscure, prolonged, provocative melon smellinous osculation. Womb weary? He rests. He has traveled. With? Sinbad the sailor and Tinbad the tailor. And Winbad the whaler and Dinbad the kaler. Vinbad the quailer and Linbad the yaler and Shinbad the fail. When? Going to the dark bed, there was a square round Sinbad the sailor rocks ox egg. In the night of the bed of all the orcs of the rocks of darkened bad the bright daylight. Where? like that before, as asked to get his breakfast in bed with a couple of eggs since the City Arms Hotel, where he used to pretend to be laid up with a sick voice, doing his highness to grab the attention of Mrs. Reard and that old faggot that he thought he'd a great leg of. And she never left us a farthing all for masses for herself and for her soul, great as miser ever was. Uh, uh, greatest miser ever was, and uh, you know, oh, I like that in him. That uh, he he was polite to old women like that, and waiters and beggars too. When oh, they're all so different, boiling, talking about the shape of my foot, he noticed even before we were introduced. I was in the DBC with Paul D laughing and trying to listen. Uh, I was waggling my foot. <laughs> ah, sirs and right. It's all his own fault if I am an adulteress. As the thing in the gallery said. How oh, much about it if that's all the harm she did in his veil of tears. 
I'd love to have the whole place swimming in roses. God of heaven, there is nothing like nature. The wild mountains, yes, and the sea with the waves rushing and the, the beautiful country with all the fields of wheat and oat. And as for saying there's no God, I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for all their learning. Why don't they go and create something? Atheists, or whatever they call themselves. <laughs> Wash the cobbles off themselves first. Then they go howling for the priest and they're dying. Uh, I mean, who was it in the universe before there was anyone at all that made it all? Who? Ah, that they don't know. And neither do I, so there you are. <laughs> ah, they might as well stop the sun from rising tomorrow. The sun shines for you, he said, the day we were lying in the rhododendrons on Hoth Head in his grey tweed suit and his straw hat. Yes. Sixteen years ago. My God. After that long kiss, I nearly lost my breath. He said I was a flower of the mountain. And yes, so we are, all flowers, all a woman's body. That's the one true thing he said in his life. And the sun shines for you today. Yeah, that's why I liked him, because I saw that he understood or felt what a woman is. And I knew I could always get round him. And I gave him all the pleasure I could, leading him on until he asked me to say yes. And I wouldn't answer first, only looked out over the sea and the sky. And I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of. Mulvey and Mr. Stanhope and Hester and Father and old Captain Groves and the sailor playing All Birds Fly and all oh, the poor donkeys and, and the sentry outside of the governor's house. Poor devil, half roasted. And the Spanish girls with laughing in their shawls and their high combs and the poor donkeys slipping half asleep in the old castle. Thousands of years old. Yes, and the night we missed the boat, I'll just see us. And oh, that terrible deep down torrent. And oh, the sea, you see, crimson, sometimes like fire. And the glorious sunsets. And the fig trees in the Alameda gardens. Yes, and the rose gardens. And the jessamine and geraniums and cactuses and Gibraltar as a girl where I was, a flower of the mountain. Yes, and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall, and I thought, well, as well him as another. And I asked him with my eyes to ask again, would I say yes? And then he asked me, oh, would I say yes? Or to say yes, my mountain flower, and I put my arms around him, and I drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume and his heart was going like mad and yes i said yes i will yes
Take it back.